Funding for the production of folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance. Straight ahead on folks, a look at the gifted and talented program in East Baton Rouge Parish. What makes a child gifted, and why has minority enrollment in the program dropped? We'll talk to parents, teachers, and others involved with the GT program, all on today's edition of Folks. Hello everyone and welcome to folks. I'm Sonia Massengale. Most parents would probably like to believe that his child is brighter, more intelligent or creative than other children. As the child approaches school age, some parents can confirm that their child is indeed gifted in intelligence of some kind or another. This is a child who would benefit from a gifted and talented program, such as the one in East Baton Rouge. If a teacher or a parent suspects a child is gifted, even at an early age he can be tested and then placed in a classroom for gifted children or given support services designed to enhance his natural ability. Most would agree that these children have special needs that should be addressed, but the gifted and talented program in East Baton Rouge has been a subject of controversy since the beginning. First, the program was seen as a way of discriminating against blacks and other ethnic minority groups because standardized tests for intelligence were used to determine a child's potential in the gifted program. A special assessment was then added to the testing procedure called SAMPA, and critics of SAMPA feel that SAMPA, by adding points to a culturally deprived child's assessment scores, might be giving some students an unfair advantage. But here we have the gifted program in East Baton Rouge, struggling along despite setbacks in education funds, still doing all it can to meet the needs of gifted students. It's supposed to be weird if it's going to be different. Yeah, that's true. It should be different. And this will definitely be different. A classroom for gifted students generally looks and sounds like any other classroom, but it's not just a regular class. These students are working at an accelerated pace. Although this is a combined fourth and fifth grade class, many of them are reading at a level far above their ages and grade level. You have children who have these high IQs, great creativity ability, and they're just not being challenged in the regular classroom. It's very difficult for a teacher who has 20, 32 children in the classroom to meet that one or that, that those two children who need the extra. These children need to be able to go further with what they can do. They need to learn to elaborate, to um, develop the skills that Benjamin Bloom, the higher level thinking skills, that, and that's what we work on, and that's important. A regular classroom teacher does not have time to do all of that. Rochelle Williams has been teaching gifted students for about six years. She says that working with gifted students is rewarding and different from working with an average classroom. There is no one definition. There are a lot of definitions. I think that a gifted child is a child who will, a child who's creative, a child who um, can be a good, is a good student, but not always a good student. There are those that are not good students, but they're gifted because of their, what they come up with in their minds and the ideas that they have, their views, their opinions, and how they want to work with them and how strongly they feel about them. Um, there's no one definition. It's a collaboration of a bunch of different things. It's, it's in the child. The children are eager to learn. They want to learn. But then I can see that in the regular classroom, too. You, you have parents, the parents, the parental support is a big difference. They're behind those children. They're interested. They know that Johnny's gifted, and they want him to achieve. That, that has a lot to do with this situation than the regular classroom. The children 
are interested in certain things and they have a desire to want to do it more. Sometimes they don't. Um, sometimes you have to have a variety of things for them to choose from for them to see. Um, other differences are we, we um, there's a lot more to work with in the gifted program with the children than in the regular classroom. Few educational programs have generated as much interest as the gifted and talented programs in our schools. Interest and controversy. There is some concern being expressed that the enrollment of minority children, specifically black students, is down. That's a problem that we are currently trying to investigate. About three years ago, we had a massive minority recruitment trying to get blacks, particularly, into the gifted program. Our numbers went up. We had approximately 20% of the children in the gifted program were black. In the last three years, that number has fallen 20%, whereas the number of whites and other groups in the program has increased 20%. We don't know why. We've asked uh, pupil appraisal to give us some results, uh, some ideas, and they have gone back, they've checked their records, they're trying to determine why children leave the program, what's happening. But their records are not up to date. They're doing the best that they can, but they can't give us the information. So we don't know why blacks are leaving the program. But we would like to see more minorities in the program because it's a good program. Much of the controversy surrounding the gifted program is rooted in the testing procedures to identify gifted students. To avoid discriminating against gifted students who are disadvantaged, underprivileged children are often given an additional assessment called SAMPA. SAMPA stands for the System of Multicultural Pluralistic Assessment. It is something that was developed by Jane Mercer in California. And actually SAMPA is used to give us another, another perspective of a child. It's just another measure of a child's learning potential. Basically, it's based on the fact that if a child using an intelligence test, and they use the whisk R to compare a SAMPA, but using that test, if the child came from the same background as the children who were normed in that test, then everybody should be expected to, to function the same. However, if they did not have the same exposure, which Mercer is saying they did not, many of the children from minority backgrounds, uh, what we call non-Anglo, then what, what we're saying is that they didn't have the same exposure, the same opportunities, the same uh, motivation, then how can you compare them to the same? So SAMPA actually gives us another opportunity to look to say this is maybe what the child's estimated learning potential would be. Some children's estimated learning potential and school functioning are exactly the same. Others are not. Enid Mason is in charge of pupil appraisal for the East Baton Rouge Parish School Board. She says that many people are concerned that SAMPA gives some students an unfair advantage. It's so controversial because there have been misnomers. People feel, well, you've just given these children points, and that makes them get into the program. No, we don't give them points. It is an adjustment to the, to the intelligence score that they have received on the test, and it says that if they were given this, if this were the same, um, if they had the same opportunities, the same background, the same motivation, then this is probably what the child's potential could be. I think a lot of the controversy is because many people feel that if the child had not had sample points, he would not have been in the program. So that you're putting that child at a disadvantage. You're giving him points, you're putting him in a program where he can't succeed. But then that's not been proven. We've asked for additional information. I have no information to say that yes, a child that was put in the program because of sample points, or with the help, not because of, with the help of sample points, is not succeeding. That he's not doing as well as any child who was placed in the program without the points. And until some concrete information is given to us, then I think that they, people just need to wait. Eight-year-old Candace Milligan is enrolled in a gifted program. There was no need for Sampa because she is not a disadvantaged child. Pam Milliken is Candace's mother and an elementary school counselor, but it was Candace's kindergarten teacher who first suspected that Candace was gifted. Uh, she's uh, my first child, my only child, and I didn't have a child to compare with, even though I was a, a classroom teacher. I always taught upper, upper grades. 
uh, it was her preschool teacher who sort of turned the light on to me. Um, she was in preschool in Metairie, Louisiana, and uh, when she was four, they talked a lot to me about putting her in a, in a special school. Well, I decided to move, and then it was television. Uh, that was a, a, a spot that was done concerning testing, testing of children, preschool age, and so I took her down and got her tested, and that's how she got in. But it really wasn't any significant thing that I recognized in her as a parent. Millican refers children from her school for gifted testing, but thus far has not been able to enroll any of her students in a gifted program. She says that even Sampa cannot make up completely for a culturally deprived background. I work in an area that's very economically deprived. And realistically speaking, um, education of parents and exposure to, to different things will help a child uh, get into the program or at least beyond the initial screening. Um, I, I feel that uh, a lot of the children that I have worked with haven't been to preschool. Their first uh, contact with, a formal, with formal education is four years old where sometimes a lot of children who are in the gifted program have been in preschool at least from three two years old and have had some kind of formal education. A lot of my children who I have referred didn't have that. You know, their first contact with formal education began sometimes at five because it was just, uh, this is the first year that kindergarten has been uh, mandatory. So I've had children who didn't have any formal education for the first five years of their life. Cultural background seems to have an effect on children in the classroom, but other than testing, how can a teacher or parents identify a gifted student? Are grades the only measure of a gifted child? A lot of times, Sonia, children, can be, children are overlooked simply because they don't make the A's that some teachers think they need to make. Um, in this parish, we, look, we do look at high achievers in the regular classroom, but there are other things that can let you know if a child is gifted in the classroom or if you think they're bored or they're, they might score high on tests, but they're not doing it in the classroom, those kinds of things. Grades are not always important. They get to be important because of the system that we are in, but work needs to be done on that too. Well, as a counselor, uh, teachers refer children uh, often. Uh, basically, they look at their performance in the classroom academically. Then um, it's mentioned to me, and then I look at uh, CAP scores that they have in their CUME folders. And then we do a formal referral if I feel like I'm in agreement with the teacher. And then we do initial screening and then we proceed to, if, if the child goes beyond the initial screening, then we do full evaluation. We've got to have some way of measuring children. We've got to get them where they um, are showing some kind of progress. In the gifted program, we do rating scales and um, we, we will say, okay, if you cannot do, if you're working on this project, do this, contracts, things like that. I think that gifted children, though, need to learn that there are certain things that are expected of them. They cannot just slide or they don't just have to do it just because they're gifted. We have to live in cert by certain rules and as gifted adults, so I think as gifted children, they need to learn that they have to live by certain rules and even if they don't want to, sometimes we have to make them buckle down and do it. Not always. I don't think as much pressure on the grade needs to be put on it as it is. We need to understand the whole gifted child and not concentrate so much on the grades. I think the gifted and talented program is important for especially minority students because it allows those students opportunities that they may not get in the regular classroom. The ratio of children to teacher in the gifted program is smaller. It allows for more individual attention. It allows those children to go horizontally 
in the classroom. They can go more in depth into matters, whereas in a regular classroom, they couldn't get that. It's not that the teacher doesn't want to do it, but because of the limitations of class size and the different levels that she has in a particular classroom, she can't always do it. So I think the gift gives those children a little more insight into things that they can do. We're trying to meet the needs of a certain segment of uh, children in our school system. As a parent and as a counselor, that's, that's my opinion about that, that we just are trying to meet that group's specific needs. You've got to start somewhere. And until it is realized in Louisiana that education is the key to the future, we have to work with what we have. But I would love to see the same opportunities for all children. It, it, would, it would definitely be beneficial. Joining us in the studio today to discuss the gifted program in East Baton Rouge Parish is Gerald Lively. He's the president of the Baton Rouge chapter of the Association for Gifted and Talented Students, Ms. Dot Rumfellow. She's been with the gifted program here in East Baton Rouge for eight years, and she is the parent of three gifted children. And Mrs. Lois St. Amant, director of Upward Bound at Southern University and the mother of a gifted student. Welcome to folks. Gerald, first of all, ap approximately how long has the gifted program been in action in this parish? In this parish, in this state, we've had a gifted program for about 12 years now. And we know that it's not unique to the state of Louisiana, but there is something unique about the Baton Rouge program. What is that? Well, in Baton Rouge, we have uh, a full-time setting for children from the first grade through the 12th grade. We also have what is more traditional in the other parishes, that is a resource program, which is also uh, available to elementary age children. So that means, as we said, it's a self-contained program. Yes, this unique. is a special classroom. The kids are in that classroom all day in the elementary schools. In the middle and high schools, they are in a self-contained setting in that it's a high school with special math, English, uh, social studies, foreign language classes, things like that. And you also put the kids in some regular classes with the regular kids that are at that high school. Ms. Rumfellow. Approximately how many students are in the gifted program, say, this year, and what percentage of those are minorities? Right now there are about 2,800 identified gifted students in East Baton Rouge Parish, and of that number, about 369 are minority students. That's about 13 percent of our program. Okay. Does the gifted program work side by side, say, with the magnet school programs, or do you, can you find your gifted students in magnet schools as well? as gifted classrooms? Uh, two of our gifted programs are located at magnet school sites, but really they're two separate programs. And how many, how many programs of gifted do we have? Or should I say how many schools are involved? There's one high school location. There are three middle school locations. We have 14 self-contained elementary centers, and we have resource or pull-out programs at 21 elementary schools. That's quite a few students. Mm -hmm. um, we still don't have answers as to why the number of minority students has dropped, right? But we're working on that. We're working on it. We, we certainly already know that, of course, magnet schools do tend to attract some of those students. And, of course, the long bus rides certainly deter some of those students from coming to gifted programs. That's understandable. Mrs. St. Amant, how does Upward Bound go along with the gifted program? Well, I, I think that uh, we have a number of things that are very, very similar. We're dealing with students who have ability. Uh, these students, in addition to that academic ability, they also need some cultural, recreational, um, social kinds of activities. And I think the classroom sizes parallel very much the uh, sizes of the gifted and talented program. Our students are selected based on records, scores, test scores, grades, and that sort of thing. And what we're trying to do with them is to keep them in school to make sure that they get the benefit of all of the academics and then to go into a college setting. And I think the, the Gifted and Talented program works very similarly because they're trying to keep the students interested, to try to motivate them, and to, to push them on to, to greater things. So I think the programs are very, very similar. I see. And do you have a crossover of students? We have students in our program who are also students in the um, Gifted and Talented program. There are several high school students who are a part of our program, and they are a part of the Gifted and Talented program here. And we find that a lot of things that happen with them at school, they bring to us, and, and we can benefit from it, from it. And then we can also help them to benefit from what we do. 
for the programs are similar. On a personal level, with your student, your child, who okay. is gifted, mm -hmm. did you see a change in the type of work he did when he went from, say, a regular school program into the gifted program? Quite a bit, quite a bit. And the change was, was as far as I'm concerned, was um, very, very good. He has uh, the ability, I think, to do a lot of things that maybe he was not doing in the regular classroom setting. And I'm really pleased with what's happening with him. His assignments or uh, I guess, on a, on a much greater level in terms of the things that he's bringing home, in terms of what he asked us to help him do. You know, I'm almost back in school again myself in terms of attempting to help him. But I have found that uh, it is a difference, and I think a very positive difference in terms of what he is getting now. Ms. Romefellow, how is the gifted program faring under the recent round of educational budget slicing that's been going on? Well, I think we've Two years ago, we lost the uh, funding for the parish coordinators statewide, and that certainly is hurt in things like the recruitment program, where that person would have certainly been uh, dealing with that issue. Uh, other than that, we've been cut in materials money uh, from, what is about 80% of materials money has been cut. But still supplying a quality education from certainly. everything I've seen by visiting the uh, professionals that work in the program. That's right. Mr. Lively, is it much more expensive to have a gifted classroom than a, a regular classrooms? It's not a whole lot more expensive. It is a little bit more because you have lower pupil-teacher ratios, and you do have a little extra money for materials. Uh, if the cuts that are being proposed right now go through, that money will drop from, I think it's about $30 per student to right. about 7 or 8 which is very little. And... Uh, Whenever you're asking the schools to provide extra services for children, it's important that the state pick up the cost, the extra cost, whatever it is, especially when you get into the rural parishes. Here in East Baton Rouge Parish or in the other metropolitan areas, the school systems may be able to provide something extra for the kids. But in the rural areas where unemployment is high, uh, these parishes need all the help they can get. They need the state money to keep the programs going. All right, we've been referring to the program as both the gifted program and the gifted and talented program. But in this particular parish, what's going on with the talented portion of the program? Ms. Rumfellow, would you answer that? Very little at this point. Um, certainly, Bulletin 1508 identifies students as either gifted academically or talented. And at this point, um, we certainly have a, a full gifted program in, in the order, but um, not yet with the talented program. Mr. Lively, do you care to comment on that? Well, I would like to see a talented program throughout the state. Uh, you do have problems at identifying children uh, for the talented program. When you look at a child who may have artistic ability, for instance, you become very subjective in trying to decide whether that child actually would fit into the talented program or not. So the, the criteria for identifying the children is a little bit nebulous at this point. Whereas with gifted children, you can look at IQs, you can look at achievements in math and reading, and pretty well get an objective view of what this child is able to do. I understand, though, with, with testing of gifted children, sometimes that can be nebulous, too, since grades are not always an indication. So what kind of system is in place to help weed through those that, that aren't exactly high achievers in, in the grade? One of the things that we didn't get to in the, um, in the field piece, but that was definitely brought up, was that... The gifted underachiever is something that we're seeing a lot of these oh, yeah. days. But um, how can you weed those students out of the regular gifted? Well, or rather, pick them out and, and them give in? them the support yeah. that they need, right? Well, you've got to go by scores to a large extent. You've got, as far as state criteria, you've got to have an IQ of a certain number of points. Let's say if you're talking about a third grader, you've got to have an IQ of 130, or you have got to have very high achievement scores, or you've got to have a combination in what they call a matrix. If you don't have it, you just can't get the kids in. And uh, there are a lot of gifted underachievers. One of the very important things that I have found in working with this program is that while gifted children make up 3 to 5 percent of the population, studies say that about 20 percent of the kids who drop out of school are gifted. Now, that's a, a dropout rate of four times at least what it should be. And you've got to wonder why. People who say that we are wasting time working with these kids, that they could get it on their own, are really in error. We're losing a lot of real good kids. 
Ms. St. Amant, are you seeing a number of, say, gifted underachievers in Upward Bound as well? Yes, I think so. And what we're trying to do um, is to encourage the students to tell us if they're having specific problems, if they're having uh, specific academic needs. And I think very much the, a similar thing in terms of class size. We have very, very small classes. In addition to the faculty member, we also have a, a tutor or a teacher's aide. And I think that this makes a difference, too. I think the gifted and talented programs class sizes are small, and this allows the teacher to do more with the student, and it allows the student to, I think, express himself and do a little bit more in, in creative kinds of things. And we are dealing in both instances with the creative student and the talented student. As well. As so well. the talented yes. student is being addressed yes. in this parish yes. in some way. Well, well in our program. That's yes. reassuring. Ms. Rumfellow, what's in the future for the gifted program in East Baton Rouge Parish? What's in the works? Well, we are now in the process of doing a minority recruitment um, that the, the parents are certainly working with. Um, we will continue providing the services that we're providing for gifted students. Um, we, we provide those services from preschool through 12th grade. At the 12th grade level, we also provide concurrent enrollment with the universities for our high school students where they can take courses on the university campuses and receive high school credit and college credit for their courses. Mr. Lively, how about for the association, what are their plans in the future? One of the big things we're doing right now is a lot of lobbying to keep the state law in place which mandates education of gifted children. Without that law, a lot of the parishes, as, as I said, would not uh, take care of the needs of these children. So we're lobbying to keep the law in place and to keep the funding in place. Uh, that's the main thing. We also, throughout the state, have informational meetings. We give information to the parents. Here in the parish, we're doing things like uh, pushing for a big minority recruitment drive this year and every year. Just a, a lot of things like that, really. Well, is the association, the association is not paid members? No. The association, well, the, there is a dues. There's a $15 a year membership dues to belong to the association. Oh, the, the people pay to belong That's to the right. association. But the people who are in it are actually parents in general. They're not people who work in the school systems. Uh, you may have somebody like Dot who is in the school system and has gifted children, so she could be in it. But mostly it's parents and some teachers who just really want to make sure that uh, the kids get the kind of education that we know they need. And these, are, these are the future leaders of Louisiana and the United States we're talking about. And the parental involvement does make all the difference. Oh, absolutely. As said before. And it's free. It's the best thing that could happen to education, and it's free. Well, we're out of time today. I, I hate to leave the subject there, but I think you've said all there is to be said. It is free, and it is effective, and it's doing well. Thank you for joining us on Folks. That's all for today's program. Thanks for watching. Be sure to tune in next week for a very special program to salute Black History Month. See you then. Bye-bye. Funding for the production of Folks is made possible in part by a grant from Union National Life Insurance, serving Louisiana and the South since 1926, a family-managed corporation providing whole life insurance.